resources. And okay, thank you. Uh, and again, thank all of you for coming. I know how valuable all our time is. And, uh, you know, with soccer and kids and schoolwork and everything else uh, and family obligations, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, it's important that I say, uh, it's, I'm glad you're here because this is important knowledge. And there's very few sources for some of the things that I'm going to talk about tonight. And a lot of those sources you can gather from different arenas and different areas, but to have them all in one spot is, is kind of a rare situation. So there's people that know a lot about it, this that don't teach. There's a people that, uh, there's fewer people that know about it and are, are willing and able to articulate it and bring it to the public. So it's a good thing that you're here. I wish that uh, everybody who had gotten the email would be here because uh, although it may be an inconvenience to take some time to spend two hours talking about this, it could actually be the most valuable two hours that you would ever spend in your entire life because there can be a result that uh, allows you and your family or your loved ones to survive a, a deadly threat or a deadly attack. So without further ado, this is knowledge destroys fear, the key to surviving dangerous events. And one of the things that I'm going to be talking about tonight is how do we do that? But in order to understand how we do that, I've got to educate you about what happens to you when something like this takes place. Uh, how many young, how many students are here tonight? One, two, three, four. I'm going to take just a couple minutes before I get into the meat of this. I wanted to say a couple words. I was, I was hoping there'd be a lot more kids here because I wanted to talk just for a second to the kids uh, about a couple of things. Um, since you're here, I will take a couple minutes to talk about it because uh, it's important stuff. Let me just pose the question generally. Who, who are the people that count in your life? I'm going to ask you... Uh, I'm going to ask you, who are the people that count in your life? Mom, dad, brothers, sisters. Those kind of people are the people that count, right? All right. Now I'm going to ask another question. Do you know what peer pressure is? Well, peer pressure, I'm going to define in my terms, Peer pressure is when you do things to impress people that don't count in your life. Because the people that count are going to accept you for the way you are. And they're never going to force you to do something you don't want to do. But peer pressure, if you try and please people that don't count, you're just wasting your time. Because you're never going to be able to please everybody. And those are the people that are going to ask you to do things that you might not want to do. So as a young person growing up, going into high school probably in a couple of years maybe, there's going to be more and more of that peer pressure. And it's something that I want you to understand that you only live to please the people that count. Because who cares about those other people? If you have to do something that you don't want to do to impress someone, then they're not the people you want to have as friends. And they're not the people that you want to listen to. Okay? Now, in that same regard, I wanted to say something about bullying, because there's, there's bullying, and now it's, it's stretched into several different arenas that didn't exist before. There's cyberbullying. There's physical bullying, when people get into fights or they hurt other people. There's intimidation bullying, where people are trying to force you to be scared of them. Okay, But I want you to understand something. And what we're going to talk about here tonight will relate to a lot of the, the bullying and stuff like that, and I guess you guys will pick up on that, is that, again, the bullies, you always have to stand up to them. And if you're the person who's being bullied, you need to go and you need to tell a teacher, you need to tell your mom, you need to tell your brother, you need to tell your sister, you need to tell your friends, because the bullies have to be exposed. One of the things that bullies don't like is when people find out who they are and what they're capable of doing and, and that they are being bullies, okay? As far as being called a snitch or a tattletale or anything like that, once again, who are the people that count? 
The people that count will never say that you're a tattletale or a snitch if you're doing the right thing. And doing the right thing is something that we should always, always think about. So if, someone, if you see someone being bullied or you're being bullied, you stand up for it. You report to the, to the people that need to be reported to so that everyone knows what's going on. And if they call you a, ta a tattletale or anything like that, who cares? Because they're not your friends. And if you have a friend that's a bully, get a new friend because at some point in the future they will turn and bully you also because bullies are bad guys and we're going to define how bullies turn into real bad guys in a little bit one last thing that I always like to say to kids is never ever ever put a cigarette to your lips okay golden rule that I live by with my kids. <coughs> Never ever put a cigarette to your lips, no matter what. And there's a lot of other things, drugs and things that will be presented to you as you grow older. But if you're one of those people that, that really says, I'm going to do the right thing and I don't care what people think about me if they don't count, then you're not going to have all that pressure from the peers because what is peer pressure if, if it's from people that don't count? It's nothing. It just goes right off your back. All right, now I'm going to ask you to bear with me. I would like all of us to do something here tonight. I would like to recite the Pledge of Allegiance, and you'll see why in a little bit when I talk about that. So I'd like to start and just say, uh, is there a flag uh, in the office? Okay. My hand goes over my heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. One last thing about the bullying. Uh, are there any school administrators here t today at all? Okay. I wish there was. Uh, because schools have something that's usually called a, a zero tolerance policy. And what that is, is it's kind of a, it's kind of a skate around the, the end run, around taking responsibility for bullying. Because what can happen um, is a child is being bullied, maybe physically, or intimidated uh, with threats of violence and that. And sometimes that kid, the only thing he can do is he can fight back. And it is a scientifically, psychologically, sociologically proven fact, fact, not someone's idea, that the only thing that stops a bully is a retaliatory force against the bully, okay? If it's a physical threat, the only thing that stops that is if the kid stands his ground and sometimes fights back. But because there is this zero tolerance policy in our schools, Sometimes the poor kid that just got shoved on, the, on his rear end, who gets up and, and shoves back, gets expelled along with the bully. Now, we just set a pledge that says, and justice for all, okay? So if you think about that, justice should be justice. And that means the bad guy gets punished and the good guy does not. Because if we punish a child for standing up for his, himself and his rights that should not be violated ever on a school ground, because this is a sacred place where these kids are placed under the care of our teachers to be safe and secure, if those principles are violated ever, then what have we done when we punish the kid that stands up for his own rights? We have set a precedent that says now, you know what, if you do the right thing, you're going to get punished. Not a good thing. You can talk to almost any person and say, would you want your son if, or daughter, if they did the right thing, to get punished? And everybody says no. But yet it still happens. So I'm going to quit on this uh, uh, soapbox right now with the bullying thing, but I'm, I'm a very, very, very adamant uh, proponent of anti-bullying programs and uh, 
We can talk about that someday in the future if you guys would like that. But what I'm saying is that there has to be justice for these kids and there has to be fair and equitable treatment for the bullies who should get punished and the kids that are being pun uh, bullied should never be punished. Okay. So, moving along, knowledge destroys fear, the key to surviving dangerous events. What we're going to talk about tonight is preserving your personal safety through basically these three words, awareness, attitude, and action, okay? Personal security is a working block of awareness, preparation, and mindset. Those are three vital components into staying safe at all times. Doesn't matter if it's at a school or in a mall or at home or any place else. Awareness, preparation, and mindset. Which brings us to what we're actually going to be dissecting here tonight, which is called preemptive self-defense. What is the absolute best self-defense that exists? Well, if you ask me, the best self-defense is complete avoidance of a situation where you actually have to use self-defense to protect yourself. Because if you can avoid it, then it's not happening. Okay? And we're going to get into the meat of that shortly. The two cornerstones of preemptive self-defense are, if you look at just the breakdown of the definitions, preemptive to take action in order to prevent an anticipated event from happening. Self-defense, any defensive action taken to prevent harm to oneself. So what you're going to do is you're going to learn how to, how to take a situation, analyze it, detect, figure out a plan of action, and supposedly and hopefully remove yourself from harm's way. The attributes of preemptive self-defense. Okay, education. Knowledge of what happens, what are bad guys, who are bad guys, what do they do. That's kind of what we're going to be doing here tonight. You've walked through the door and you're going to listen to the things that I, that I have to say and hopefully they're going to give you some ideas to maybe further your education or knowledge of this and become aware of it, okay? So, education and knowledge. Situational awareness. One of the most important attributes that you can have. What is situational awareness, okay? That means that I'm aware of my surroundings. When I go into a room or a theater or a restaurant, the first thing I do is I look around and say, okay, where are the entrances and where are my exits, okay? If I want to know what, if something happens, how can I get out of there? I also look around and see the people that are in the, in the room. Okay? Are there suspicious looking people? Are there people that are throwing off that vibe that they for some reason don't fit in with this crowd? Is there something that's going to pique my, the hairs on the back of my neck, so to speak? All right? Situational awareness is a 21 to 30 foot circle around you at all times, 360 degrees, that I need to be mentally and physically aware of anyone who comes within that radius. Because a person who approaches me or comes inside that radius is just about as good as within arm's reach. Because they can close that kind of a distance so fast that if I don't know that they're there, they're going to get on me or, or attack me or whatever it might be before I have a chance to, to react and preempt that attack, okay? Bias for action, all right? You have to be ready to do something, okay? And we'll talk about fight or flight and all of those things that go into that in a, in a little bit. But you need to be ready to do something. Mentally, you have to have a mental trigger that gives you 
a predetermined course of action, but you have to be ready to act, okay? Bias for action. That means I know I'm going to do something, all right? I know that when I go into an area, if there are bad guys in there or a bad guy appears out of nowhere or something happens, I know I'm going into action immediately because I have predetermined that I am ready to act, okay? Proper mindset. I mentioned mental trigger. You need to have what the Brits call the switch, okay? And it's because I worked with some guys that uh, were really, really hard-boned guys over the years, and the Brits were the ones that were the most lovable, jocular, happy, go-lucky, laughing, joking, drinking pints of Guinness and having a good time and slapping each other in the back. But the minute something happened that was out of the ordinary, boom, their switch goes on. So they could go from fun-loving to a literally being a killing machine in a heartbeat. And if it wasn't a threat, we assess the situation, switch goes back on, give me that beer and off we go again. You need to have the ability to do that. You may think that a person like myself and the way I describe some of this stuff that I walk around all day long, you know, waiting for something to happen and looking for something to happen, no. It's not the case. You would wear out. In fact, when you talk about conditions of awareness, there's something called condition uh, white, condition yellow, condition orange, and condition red. They're all escalating level of me mental and physical preparedness for action. If you walked around in the third level, condition orange, all the time, you would burn out like a real high-speed meteor going through the sky and all of a sudden, poof, it's gone. Because you can't maintain that level of awareness and uh, vigilance at all times. But you need to maintain some vigilance at all times. Never let your guard down. But you've got to have that switch, okay? On, off, on, off. And it's something that you can think about and learn, but you have to become aware of it to start. Gut feel. Probably the absolute best self-defense tool that exists. All right? Now, what do I mean by gut feel? Well, gut feel is your absolute, absolute best friend forever. Okay? There's no one on the planet, not even mom or dad, that will protect you like your gut feel does. Because it is on duty 24 hours, well, I guess we sleep once in a while. It's on duty. If you're awake, it's on duty. And it's turned on, and its radar is going, and it's scanning all the time, okay? We've all felt it. We all know it exists. And like I said, the hair's on the back of your neck. Let's re relate it to something that's fairly simple. I go over, I see a box, and I go, okay, I got to move that box. Should I get the dolly and put it on there? Uh, oh, well, I'll do it. I knew I shouldn't have picked that box up. Oh, my aching back. Oh, lordy. My gut feel, if you will, was telling me, don't pick the box up. Go get the dolly and do it right. But what we have is we have a brain. The brain gets in the way of the gut feel because the gut feel never lies, ever. Not one single time, ever. From the time you were born until the time that you lay down for the final rest, will your gut feel ever lie to you? Okay? There's an old spook saying, and that saying is, if there's any doubt, there's no doubt. That is a very, very clean way of saying, if I have a gut feel that something's bad, it's bad. Okay? The thing is, we need to learn to listen to the gut feel because it will protect. Okay, it is your shield, your protector, your armor. Because if it tells you something's up, up then listen to it. So many guys have been, should I go in this door? Should I, damn, I don't know. No, I'm going to wait until the team gets here. Boom. And there's a bad guy with an AK-47 or a bad guy strapped with bombs or a, some kind of booby trap. For some reason, 
That gut feel said, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. Let's reassess this, take it easy, step back for a minute. I'm telling you to wait. And if you listen to it, it'll save your life. All right? It'll save countless people's lives. Creative visualization, another great training aid because how do you imagine going into a room and seeing a, uh, a charge that's placed to blow bolts and nuts at you when it's activated by a bad guy? You can't really practice doing that. How do you practice being in a theater and a guy jumps up with a pistol or a shotgun or, or an automatic rifle and starts spraying bullets around the people in the, in the theater? can't really practice that, except in your mind. So you can play the what if game. What would I do if a guy came through the, the door right now with an AK-47 and started spraying bullets? I need to start to be able to play those little mind games so that I kind of familiarize myself with something like that possibly taking place and not being caught completely flat-footed when it actually happens. Well, what you <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> We will. We'll still address it specifically, actually. Moral clarity. All right. Now, we are all good guys and gals. All right? We are brought up with a set of rules in our life through society, through parents, through church, through all of the things that exist to keep our society in order, okay? We are told that you're not supposed to hurt someone else, that you're supposed to be polite, that you're supposed to be courteous, that you're supposed to mind your own business, that you're not supposed to judge people, all right? But when it comes to a bad guy, all those rules are off, okay? Unfortunately, we are so imbued with them because we are good people and because of the way that our society has existed for centuries and centuries, millennia, there's one rule above all that governs our being able to get along with each other and, and continue with our way of life and that is thou shall not kill, right? But, if you look back at the literal interpretation of the original Ten Commandments in Hebrew, it is, thou shalt not commit murder. There is a difference. Killing someone is bad. Excuse me. Murdering someone is bad. Because you've done something that's not justified. Killing a bad guy who's about to bring mayhem, death, destruction, and harm to innocent people is not a bad thing. But, because of who we are, being good guys, the last thing on earth that we ever want to do is hurt another human being, let alone take the life of another human being. So here's what happens. There have been times, it's called a hesitation shooting. Okay? A police officer walks into a room, he's on a call because there's a bad guy there. This bad guy may have already shot and killed somebody. He walks into a room, the bad guy's got a gun right there pointing at the officer. Officer's in a down ready position or has his gun up or maybe has his gun pointed at the bad guy. Bad guy shoots first. Officer goes down. He had every right justifiable, legal right, moral right, ethical right, societal right to take the life of that individual. But he didn't. He hesitated. Why is that? Because he's a good guy, just like us. All right? And that can cost you your life. Because you know what? The bad guy, he's done bad things his whole life. This is the thousandth time that he's been a bad person. Maybe a hundred thousandth time he's been a bad person. He doesn't care about you or me, right or wrong. He only cares about what he needs, and he doesn't want to go to jail. We all develop capabilities, all right? 
That police officer had hundreds of hours of training. He went through the academy. He's had lectures. He's talked about it. He's been involved in incidents where he's run up on, in other crime scenes where police officers have been shot by bad guys. Yet at that moment of truth, he still hesitated. You need to make those kind of decisions before you reach that moment of truth. Okay? Now it sounds kind of harsh, but I'll tell you what. I have no problem doing great harm and destruction to a bad guy. You want to put me in court and, and try me for excessive force or something? You know what? I'll, I'll play those cards because I know in here that the decision that I have to make in a moment like that is going to be the correct decision. All right? Now, understand this though. That is the hardest decision a civilian or a police officer will ever make. Ever. It is the hardest decision a human being in a civilian capacity or a law enforcement capacity will ever make. All right? Now, notice I left out military. Why would I? Well, I'll tell you. Because when I send a platoon into a room to get bad guys, they're going in ready with guns blazing. And they know their bad guys are in there, and they know they have to kill them if they need to or take them prisoner if they need to. When I move a battalion of men to take a hill, we know we're going to be shooting at bad guys. And we're not shooting to scare them, we're shooting to kill them. So we already know what we're going to do in a situation like that. We are bound by our command and orders to carry out those deeds, shooting at bad guys. But a police officer, he doesn't have the right to go and kill people and go right to guns. He has to deter a crime. He has to go into a situation he knows there's bad guys in there, but he has to wait until that bad guy forces the situation for him to make that hard, hard decision to take the life of the bad guy. That is the hardest decision that any man or woman will ever face. Now, when we talk about what we're going to do here tonight, you and the teachers and anybody that's on this campus or in a, in a movie theater, let's say, as a civilian may have to make that same exact decision without any training, okay? Without any foreknowledge of all the things that are going to happen when that situation comes about. So I just need you to think about that. You have to make that decision. Now, historically, Human society is, breaks into all kinds of different uh, stratas and segments and all that, but I'm looking at it strictly from the subject that I'm discussing tonight of warriors or protectors and those that need to be protected. Now, throughout history, there has been one half is protectors and one half is the ones that need to be protected. Now, there's no judgment on that. It's not cowardice or, or anything else. What it is, is it's just the way human nature, human beings are. Some people need to be protected. Some people run to danger. They grab the shield and the sword and are the protectors. They are the warriors. Every society that's ever existed on this planet has a warrior class, a warrior society, and they're held in very, very high esteem. Okay? But think about this. Every warrior class and every warrior society that, is also, that has existed on this earth also were held to a high code, a moral code, a very strict code of honor, dignity. Because if you have people that have that capacity and capability to bring destruction and harm and chaos upon other human beings that don't live by a code, guess what those people are? Those are the bad guys. 
But the real warriors live by that code, okay? Talk about the Pledge of Allegiance. Every police officer, every soldier swears an oath. And it always talks about upholding the laws, protecting the innocent. So what I'm going to say now is, if you have come to this lecture tonight, you are not one of those who needs to be protected. If you came here tonight, you have identified to me that you are of that warrior class. Because you're here to find out what you need to do when bad things happen to good people. All right? That's what a warrior is. Warrior isn't defined by how skilled he is in hand-to-hand -hand combat or how good a shot he is. A warrior is defined by one thing. They stand up for what's right and they protect the innocent. Those two things are like the most important parts of our society. That's what keeps us together and keeps us safe. All right. So you need to understand something right now. You are warriors. You have identified that by coming here tonight. So you need to understand that you do have the capability. We'll talk some more about capacity in a little while. But you are here because you want to find out what to do. So you've taken that step. There's people that didn't come tonight. They looked at the flyers and said, oh, okay. It's a good thing we're here because you're going to need us if something bad happens. The protocols of action. You ask me what to do. Okay. When something hits the fan, my wife made me promise to <laughs> not use bad words. When something hits the fan, you need to know what to do. All right? The protocols of action. Boom. First thing is detect. Okay? Second is escape. Third is barricade. Fourth, and the last choice, is engage. Now, detect. That's preemptive self-defense. That's gut feel. That's all of those things that I've talked about earlier. And we'll talk some more in that in a little while about th uh, matrix and clusters of events and things like that. But if you can detect that something bad is going to happen or there's a bad guy or you see something that gives you the idea that something's not right you have a chance then to do what? Escape. Okay? When is the best time to escape? The moment that you feel something is going wrong. That moment. There is no time like the present. Okay? Any hostage takeover situation, let's, let's look at just the sequence of events that take place. A bad guy comes, let's say bank takeover. Guy comes into the bank, boom, boom, boom. Is he there to rob? I don't know. Is he there to create mayhem, take hostages, kill people? Who knows? Maybe it's just a robbery gone wrong. But the thing that happens then is there is utter confusion and chaos at the beginning of that event. That's the best time to escape. When he doesn't know what's going on, you may certainly not know what's going on, but man, I hear a gun go off, and, and I'll tell you, what would I do? The first thing I'm going to try and do is escape. All right? Now, I'm not abandoning you, but I'm just saying... <laughs> <laughs> That's my best. If... if <laughs> I, I promise I won't abandon you. That's my best opportunity to escape safely. And now that may not be something that a police officer can do, or a security guard, or a principal, or a teacher. You may not have that option, okay? But the other people need to escape as quickly as possible. Because what happens after someone comes into a situation like that is what? They try to take control of those elements that they don't have control of at the beginning of the scenario, all right? So what do they do? They round you up. Everybody over here, okay? Down on the floor. Lay down. 
over in that corner, put them in the bank vault, whatever in the heck it happens to be. Well, guess what happens as that time marches on? Your chances for escape are going downhill in a real hurry, all right? Shooter comes on campus, boom, 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 okay? I have the ability to escape because there's a, an exit over here and I know it goes up into a field behind the building or something. You know what? I got to really think, okay, you guys have told me maybe we have to go into a lockdown. I hear gunfire coming from over there. I'm going to seriously think about getting my kids out and away from this school as quickly as possible. We'll talk about proximity and all that in a second too. Okay? Barricade. I can't escape. We're in a, we're in a room. Classroom, one, room, one uh, doorway in, no other doorway out. I don't know where the shooter is. I hear gunfire, it's coming my way. It's getting louder and louder. I need to barricade, all right? That's the next thing. I need to put something between me and the bad guy. Now, if it's my classroom, and, and I've got a 12 and 13 year olds or even eight year olds, I'm going to have them help me grab every single thing that I can in this room and put it in front of that door, all right? And hope that I can put stuff there that will prevent him from getting through easily, okay? Then I'm going to hide or put myself behind something, turning over desks, whatever. And two or three desks is better than one, let me tell you that. So that if he does fire off some rounds, I have something at least that's going to slow those down or maybe prevent him from seeing me and getting a game. Chaos. I mean, there's no question about it. But the next step is to barricade. Now, for example, I hear gunshots coming down the hall, coming down the, in between the, uh, the buildings here. Should I be hiding like over in here? Not me. I'm going to hide right up there below the windows by the door, okay? If it's not barricaded and he has the chance to come in, that's where I'm going to be. Because when he comes in that door, he has no idea what's inside this room, all right? If I'm the teacher, at that point, I need to go to that spot that I talked about, about capacity. I'm going to grab him. That's all there is to it. Or if I'm one of the students, or I'm someone in, a, in a, an event just like this, if I get up against that door, he can't see me, he can't look down and around and under. The minute he gets through that door, we're bolting for the door. I'm going to have every kid in, under my control out that door as quickly as possible. Because it's better what, is, what does a bad guy do if you're sitting, if he's come to that school, believe me, they know what's going to happen. What does he think is going to happen? He's going to go home that, tonight and watch TV? He's dying. Today, right now. Within an hour, he'll be a dead man. Whether he does it himself or he gets taken out by uh, responders, okay? His goal is to kill as many people as he possibly can. He wants to go down in history as the guy who topped, uh, well, actually, it would be the Bath School back in about 100 years ago almost, where a whole bunch of kids were killed by a real stupid guy. But my point is, is that I would rather, of course, that no one got hurt. But the difference between 15 or 16 kids in my classroom getting killed or, or severely injured, and three or four of them, uh, I gotta play those cards. That's a fact. Because if I stand and let him take control of my environment, he can do whatever he wants. I don't have control at that point. My ability to stop him and his aggression and uh, his actions, I'm gonna be playing catch up every, every second that he's in, in my environment. So again, these are tough decisions, okay? Very tough decisions, but you gotta, you got to think about some of this stuff before you are facing it when it's in your face and the gunfire is erupting and there's screams and there's all this other stuff that happens when someone gets shot, all right? Final thing, like I was saying, 
is me as a teacher, I have a moral obligation to protect these kids, okay? Just like a police officer does. Police officer knows he's gonna have to go face bad guys. If he gets a call, it doesn't matter what it is, he has to respond to it, okay? A teacher who I've entrusted or that we have entrusted our most precious national treasure, our children, you better be ready to step up to the plate, okay? Because I have given the responsibility of the safety of my child to another person. And I expect that person to protect my children at all costs, okay? identifying the problem, okay? We need to figure out what we need to prepare for. Well, the good news is crime is down. Just look at the murder rate statistics. And this administration will tell you, look at the good job we've done. Murder rate's way down. It's been declining for about the last 30 or 40 years. But what's the truth in that statement? 1950s, we didn't have EMTs. 1950s, we didn't have trauma centers. 1950s, we didn't have a lot of the high-tech surgical procedures that we have now. The murder rate has gone down because fewer people are dying of serious injuries. That's the fact, okay? You need to look at what the true statement is that's not being told to us. Aggravated assaults continue to rise. 1957, 65 per 100,000 aggravated assaults. Roughly the year 2000, over 450 per 100,000 aggravated assaults. That's five times or more the number of aggravated assaults taking place. That means one person doing great harm to another. But our medical technologies have <coughs> skyrocketed in terms of being able to save people that at one point, several years ago, they were going to die. They would have been placed in the triage of, he ain't going to make it, so we're going to work on somebody else. Now those people are making it. For example, in, back in medieval history, there was something called the three-finger rule. Does anyone know what that is? Three-finger rule? Okay. If you were stabbed with a knife or a sword, and it went in two fingers, depth, you're probably going to live. If it went into a depth of three fingers, you're dying. Infection, penetration of an internal organ, bleeding, internal bleeding, okay? Now you can have, I mean, we watch TV, for gosh sakes, you find a guy who uh, falls off a building and lands on a piece of rebar, and he's got three pieces of rebar going right through him. They take him in, fix him up. A month later, he's out running a marathon. What I'm saying is that the point is, is that crime statistics, are, they're really not down, okay? They've leveled off a little bit recently, but they're still occurring at a rate far and above what the people that are in power would like you to believe, because they want to let, make you think that they're doing a good job at keeping us safe and sound. <clears throat> Bad news, aggravated assaults are up. Good news, 
most of those crimes take place in areas that you expect those crimes to take place, okay? Inner cities, poverty-stricken areas, drug-infested areas, you, you kind of expect that stuff to happen in those places, right? And that's where most of those aggravated assaults take place. And they talk about all the stuff going on uh, with gun control and all that, and then uh, they ignore the fact that in Chicago, on an average weekend, 16 or 17 young black kids are shot dead. That's in that area. We expect that to happen, okay? We don't expect that to happen Palos Verdes. So that's good news. The bad news is the lottery principle is in effect. Now, they'll tell you how astronomical the odds are to win the lottery, right? Do you stand a chance of winning it? One in a million? But when those numbers are drawn on Friday night, someone always wins. When we talk about an active shooter or a terrorist attack, they are not bound by a social or economic boundary. They can occur anywhere. That's the lottery principle. Okay? There are no more school massacres in, down, in the city center area of St. Louis than there are in other places in the United States. In fact, there may never even be a school massacre in the south side of Chicago. Because we live here in a real nice affluent area in a protected bubble with very low crime. Because what are most of the people that live in this area? We're good, we're good guys. We have jobs. Our kids are raised well. A lot of the people that commit crimes in this area don't live in this area, all right? So we're, we're pretty safe. Newtown, Connecticut, Sandy Hook. Not very much crime in that city. Columbine, Colorado. Not very much crime in that city. Aurora, Colorado, theater massacre. Not very much crime in Aurora, Colorado either, okay? My point is, is it can happen anywhere, anytime. It takes one goofball who gets PO'd. There was a guy recently who, who, uh, who was, he was mad at the city council. This is a few years back went into a school and shot a whole bunch of kids. He was mad at the city council. It had nothing to do with the school. Okay? It had nothing to do with poverty. It had nothing to do with not having a job or anything else. Okay? It can happen anywhere. So, we're talking about like an active shooter. That's a goofball or a bad guy or a crazy man or sometimes a kid who decides that for whatever reason he wants to go and cause mayhem at, at a school or a theater or someplace where there's a lot of people. Or terrorist attack. Okay? They're not bound by any of those socioeconomic strata or boundaries either. They can occur anywhere. And I'll give you a little example. Back in the 1980s, I had a chance to work with some guys that was... Uh, they were an international, uh, I mean, if you believe me when I'll tell you that Mission Impossible, that, that's true. There, there are, those things exist. Guys like Mission Impossible are real. And I happen to know some of them. And they were an international consortium made up of some Germans, some Brits, Norwegians, U.S. Navy SEALs, some French. And their job was going around trying to make sure that nuclear material was not being distributed on the black market after the breakup of the Union, okay? But 
because they're on the hot trail for bad guys because bad guys want those types of weapons because now one man can be a weapon of mass destruction if he's got nuclear material, whether it's a dirty bomb or if there was any way, that, at that time there was no way they could construct a nuclear weapon. But the point is it was terrorists that we were tracking. They were tracking. And they discovered a plot by a gentleman that was named Abu Nidal. And he had an organization called ANO, which is Abu Nidal Organization. And he was one of the world's most wanted terrorists. And he killed a lot of innocent people. Well, guess what the plot is that they discovered? Because there was a sleeper cell here in the United States. But it would have crippled the United States. And you know what it was? They were going to go to Friday night basketball games in the mid... Is there anyone here from uh, mid... Mid -America, middle America, Illinois, Kansas, Oklahoma. I'm from Wisconsin. <sighs> Little cities. My, my town had 2,400 people. Basketball game on Friday night. The whole town was there. The entire student body is there. Gymnasium. Some doors on one end, some doors on the other end, some doors into the locker room. What they were going to do is they were just going to walk into that gym, multiple gyms in multiple cities, barricade the door, and just start shooting kids. Okay? It was a perfect plan. My hometown had, I think, three police officers on duty at any one given point in time. And they weren't at the basketball game because they were still out, supposed to be on duty. Think of what could happen in 30 or 40 seconds in an environment like that. That was what they were going to do because they knew it would strike a, a dagger deep into the heart of this country that we couldn't recover from. Because it was going to say this, you guys think you live 11,000 miles away across an ocean on both sides? We can reach right over there and take your most precious national resource. And that was what they were going to do. They nailed that over in, uh, in Lebanon, actually, and uh, took those guys down big time. So, 1980, do you think my little hometown was... Did they even, were there people in my town that they didn't even know what the hell a terrorist was? Is that a guy in a monster movie? Just think what that would have done, okay? Well, here we are, 2015. Eight miles south of the United States border in Juarez, Mexico, ISIS training camp. What are they training for? They're training to do great harm, destruction, and death to United States citizens. They're not down there training to have the ISIS Olympic team. Okay? Homeland Security Conference one month ago. You'll never hear this. You'll never see it. Approximately 5,000 active jihadi Islamic activists inside the United States right this second, right now. Waiting for their internet signal or call to tell them to go. All right? Now, thank, thank God we have the apparatus that we have here in the United States that is on guard at all times. The good guys can never rest, okay? We have to stop every single attack. We have to stop every single, we have to, it's the epitome of preemptive self-defense. There's a the CIA maxim is detect, den deny, destroy, okay? Detect the threat, deny the threat, which is either engage active countermeasures, move the threat to safety, Destroy means exactly what it means. Destroy 
the ability of the enemy to do harm to the target or victims that they intended. So, can it happen here? Sure it can. Will it happen here? We all pray that it won't. But if it does, we need to understand how that happens. So what we've done now is we've identified what I'm going to talk about here. Active shooter or a terrorist attack. Because both of them actually in, in the process of an attack, they follow the same rules. Okay? Are there any first responders in here tonight? One? I know there's a former first responder here. Okay, so we got a couple, a couple of frontline guys. Two types of predators. Now I'm going to talk about bad guys, predators, terrorists. It's, it's interchangeable words. So when I say bad guy or predator or attacker, it, it's the same guy. I'm not switching gears or anything like that. Okay? Two types of predators. Process predator and reward predator. Okay? Now, process predator is a guy who attacks someone brings harm, mayhem, and destruction upon somebody or something because they like to. All right? They like the feeling of power, of dominance, of submission, of being the guy who is like, I killed 700 people, that beat the old record by four. That's a process predator. The reward predator, that's the guy who says, I want your car because he's going to take it to the shop, chop shop and sell it. I want your purse. He wants something that he gains from, okay? Monetary, drugs, whatever. Your stuff in your house, all that. Bummer is a terrorist and an active shooter on campus are both of those things combined. Active shooter wants to kill people, wants to go down in history as someone who's done something that goes into the history books. You know, in a lot of countries, they don't ever publish the names of, of the bad guys. There, there's law, especially on people that are under the age of 21. They never publish their names. You won't ever see the name of the guy who goes into a school in Germany and, and shoots 16 kids. Okay? They deny him his reward. It's actually a very effective preemptive self-defense tactic, but the United States and its media-driven uh, culture can't get that. Same thing with the uh, terrorist. He's, he's both a process predator and a reward predator. A lot of times it's for a political state. Okay? I want you to know the plight of the poor Palestinian people, or I want you to know what you have done to uh, uh, the religion of Islam in my country, etc. They want to make that statement. That's the reward, the goal. But at the same time, anybody who, who's going to kill innocent people, there's something wrong there. They're doing it because they like to do that. Okay? You can't convince a normal person, in our terms of normal anyway, to do that for any reason. So, the guys that do that kind of stuff, they're bad guys. Those guys that line up all those people in, on the beaches in Libya and all that, come on. You think they don't like what they're doing? Yeah. Zarqawi, do you think he didn't like doing what he was doing? Those are just sociopathic predators that have now mantled themselves under a cloak of some political agenda. I'm getting a little bit off the subject, sorry. All attacks, all attacks follow a process. That's when I said the difference between a terrorist and an active shooter is the same. Okay? Prerequisites for an attack. You need to have intent. That's a person who says, I'm going to go over to that school because I'm pissed at the city council. Terrorist, I'm going to go to that school because that's what they told me to do. They have the intent to do harm mayhem, destruction, death to a victim or victims. The means. 
weapons. chemicals, all of those kind of things that could be used, including, if we look at bullying and things like that, physical size, okay? A great big person has the means to inflict harm on a smaller person, okay? So, I mean, it's not just about weapons, and again, I'm, I'm straying a little bit, but we're going to, you'll see why I mention that. They have to have the means, that's the weapons, the bombs, whatever it is that they've decided they're going to use. They have to have proximity to the target, okay? Here's an example. Rick, if I had a machete and I was standing right here, I'm close enough to attack you with a machete. So you are justified in using deadly force against me if I'm threatening to come at you and I'm swinging this knife and I'm saying I'm going to kill you with this machete. If I'm standing across the street saying that to Rick, I'm out of range. So now proximity doesn't allow me the means, even though I have intent and means, I can't bring harm on him because he's out of the range of the effective use of this weapon, okay? Whatever the weapon has to be, the terrorist has to be close, the, the perpetrator has to be close enough to have the maximum effect of that weapon. They also need opportunity, okay? That means we detonate the bomb when the car with the dignitary goes by. It has to be an opportunity. I'm not going to go into a theater and set a bomb off at 2 o'clock in the morning when there's no one there. I'll go into a theater and set a bomb off at 8 o'clock when it's a packed house. In other words, those things have to exist. All right. Now, the good news about this is if you subvert any one of those, you stop the attack. You take away the intent by through detection, detect, deny, destroy, stop the attack. Take away the means, find the weapons, deactivate the weapons, tackle the guy, disarm him, take away the attack. Proximity, keep the victims or targets at a distance, that's, remember when I said escape, I'm going to take these kids to the field as far away as I can possibly get them, stops the attack. Don't give them the opportunity, stops the attack. Lock doors, stops the attack. Nobody, nobody goes to sleep at night and doesn't lock their door, right? You don't want to give the bad guy an opportunity to come in your house. He's already got all those other things in place. Stop one of those and you can stop everything. Now we're going to start talking about the title of the lecture, okay? Because now we've identified what I'm describing, we've identified, we've learned a little bit about the modus operandi of these guys, and now we're going to talk about what happens after the first bang. What is fear? Okay. Fear is an emotional response caused by the anticipation of something that you don't want to have happen. Am I scared of having my wife bring a birthday cake and put it in front of me? No, because I want that to happen. It's the things that I don't want to have happen that I'm scared of. Fear is broken down into both rational and irrational fears. Some are real, some are perceived. The five fears, the top fears, rational fears. Fear of not being in control. Number one fear, if you basically go to the core root of what makes a person have anxiety 
which is another expression of fear, it's a different word, is lock, lack of control, loss of control, okay? Why are people scared to fly in an airplane? It's not because they're scared it's going to fall out of the sky. It's because someone else is in control and a lot of people have a lot of problems with putting their personal safety or their control of an environment in someone else's hands. It's, a, it's one of the basic fears. It's also a great fear because if we didn't have that, we wouldn't have such a good time on roller coasters. <laughs> I mean, think about it. It's being scared witless because you're not in control, but in the end, you know you're kind of safe. Number two, fear. Fear of harm or death. Absolutely. No one wants to get hurt. No one wants to die. Number three, fear of loss. Loss of a loved one, loss of possessions. You don't want to give your purse up. People will fight to the death for their purse, okay? There's a, there's a fear that you that we want to protect all of these things, okay? And that someone else might be out there waiting to take it away. Fear of failure, another baseline fear. It's something that keeps a lot of people from succeeding in life or being living to their full potential. Fifth fear is fear of the unknown, okay? Now what's fear of the unknown? Can we be scared of something that might not exist? I think so. Because I remember being scared of the dark and having to have a light on in my room. And I remember being scared of monster movies. And I remember, I remember being scared of ghost stories. Okay, well now I know all that stuff, it doesn't exist. There's nothing to be scared of. There's no ghosts. There's no monsters. Dark's not scary. So can I learn... To not be afraid? I think everybody in here has been scared of something in their life at one time when they were a little kid and they learned that that wasn't anything you need to be scared of after a while. Think about a kid who goes to the doctor for the first time or second time, let's say, and gets a shot. Okay, Johnny, tonight we're going on to the doctor. You've got to get that other diesel shot. Oh my gosh, the kid goes into panic. He's scared. He doesn't want to go in there. Goes into the doctor. She distracts him. She's talking to him. Boom. Okay, we're all done. He's like, man, I was, gonna, I was supposed to cry. Okay? So you can fear things that really aren't worth being scared of. And you can learn to face them and not be scared of them. Now, irrational fears. Category of phobia. What's a phobia? It's an irrational, uncontrollable, overwhelming fear of a specific object or event. I have a phobia. I'm scared witless of spiders. And I mean, I'm not kidding. You, if I saw a spider crawling on my shoulder, you would see me jump 12 feet in the air and run for the door as fast as possible, probably screaming like a little girl. Uh, I can't control it. I mean, I've fought it and tried and, you know, I'm, I guess I'm not man enough to be face the spiders, but that's a phobia. I, I just can't fight it. It's, it happens. I can tell myself right now, I'll never be scared of another spider again, but man, you put one on my shoulder or one crawls over the pillowcase at night and I'm, I'm on the ceiling defying gravity. So what's another very common phobia? Fear of snakes, okay? A lot of people are just scared of snakes. In fact, 15 to 20 percent of the general population has a phobia of snakes. So that's a common phobia. Is, is anyone in here scared of snakes? Okay, so it's out there, okay? So it's pretty common, but what is the king of all fears? Even more so than the lack of control, which is the number one rational fear. The number one phobia is interpersonal human aggression. You and I 
Because 98% of the population, 98% of the general population, that is the number one fear that exists. So I know there's people besides myself that have a great fear of interpersonal human aggression. Okay? Why is that? Why is that the king of all fears? Because 98% of all the people that live are good people. So what are they least expecting to ever happen to them, ever? Is another person that they assume is also a good person to try and do them great bodily harm. It's so far off most people's radar that when it happens, it's the most traumatic thing that exists. Having another person trying to kill you, that's the greatest fear that exists. Interpersonal human aggression. Okay? It's another reason why bad guys are so effective, okay? They're effective because they know how it affects someone. They know how to trigger the response they want so they can have their way, whatever that way may be. So they use it against us. So, when we take loss of control, number one rational fear that exists, and interpersonal human aggression that's the number one phobia, what does that add up to? That adds up to mortal terror. Because what happens in an event like an active shooter or a terrorist attack? Number one, you're out of control. I have no control over what's going on. This event happens, it's unfolding right now as I'm standing here, I'm out of control. Number one, rational fear. Caused by another human being, interpersonal human aggression. King of all fears. Put those two together, holy mackerel. The bad guys know this. Now, when I talked about bullying earlier tonight, why do you think that bullying has such a dramatic and devastating effect on a child? Well, guess what's happening? Loss of control interpersonal human aggression. I'm not going to say the things that kids do as a result of being bullied. We all know that. I've got young people here in the audience. It can drive kids to do those kinds of things. Okay? That's why. Because those are the effects that bullying has on a child. Well, what's a bad guy? He's a grown-up bully, all right? Same thing. What is the opposite of fear? Courage, okay? Courage is the opposite of fear. Bravery. But what is courage? Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is being scared and still doing what you know must be done. Now anyone who's ever been in combat will tell you one thing. They were scared. Even though they may have committed great deeds of bravery and valor, they were scared. One of my friends told me one time, he said, Ernie, a uh, study that we did, we found that one out of four soldiers in combat was scared witless. And one of the other veterans said, you know what, that does prove something. That proves the other three guys were lying. Because everybody's scared when the bullets are flying and people are getting hurt, all right? But bravery and courage is persevering in spite of that, in spite of that fear. Now there's two things on the battlefield that are contagious. Does anyone know what they are? 
cowardice, cowardice, and courage. Cowardice and courage. Someone starts to run, guess what happens to the rest of the guys on the front line? I'm out of here. It's contagious. Some guy picks up the flag and leads the charge forward. They follow him. Courage. Okay? As a teacher or an adult, a civilian, in an environment when innocent people are being harmed, you cannot let cowardice become contagious. You need to step up to the plate. Remember when I said that about the teachers and the moral responsibility and the fact that they're going to have to make that hard, hard decision? You're going to have to be ready to lay your life down to save those kids. That's a fact. Just like a mother or a dad would do for his own child. You have to do the hard thing, the scary thing, because it is the only thing to do. There is no other choice. What does fear do to us? Okay, we've all heard of fight or flight. Has everyone heard those terms? I mean, we're taught it in school and all that. There's more. Fight or flight are only two of the possibilities that may happen when you are th faced with a life-threatening event, okay? There's fight, flight, posture, submit, and freeze, okay? Now, fight, we all know what that is. You get confronted by something or someone, a bear or whatever, and you got to, you got you know where to run, you got to fight. Flight, we know what that is. That's part of that preemptive self-defense. That's part of that escape at the most earliest possible moment. Body prepares to get out of dodge. The other thing is posture. We see it all in, in all the animals. We have to remember something. No matter who we are as human beings with a soul and, and all of those other things, we're still animals, so we're still bound by the, by the rules of, of Mother Nature, if you will, okay? And in the animal kingdom, um, if you look at animals, they don't, they don't fight to the death for control of the herd or um, the best watering hole and stuff like that. Inner species will fight to the death for it, but same species, they don't fight to the death. They, they posture and they intimidate and one person, or excuse me, one animal will back down usually, okay? It's a dominant submission type of thing. Well, we're people and we're animals and we still fall prey to that at times, okay? That's the puffing up that you see when guys are gonna get into a fight. It's posturing, okay? Submit. Please, 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 please don't hurt me, okay? It's possible, could happen. Could happen to any of us. Freeze is the deer in the headlights. There's people that will just literally freeze. There's no emotion to it. They're, <laughs> they're just frozen. Events are happening around them, chaos. That's also a possibility. Now you gotta be aware that these things can happen because I'm gonna tell you right now, no one, no one knows how you're gonna react to a life-threatening event. You don't know, okay? Even a police officer or a soldier who's been in combat multiple times, he doesn't know how he's gonna react the next time. Chances are he's gonna react in a more controlled way, but the dynamics of every situation are completely different, okay? No one knows how they're gonna react. So you need to know what are the possibilities of the way that you might react. So when it happens, you can go, okay, got it. Freezing or submitting, it's not good. I had to change my plan. Physiological and psychological effects of a perceived threat. Now,
any time that you face a spontaneous threat, part of our evolutionary system that, that's keeping us alive as a species that allowed us to dominate this planet is your survival instincts, if you will. All right? That's controlled not by the frontal cortex, but by the middle brain, the limbic brain. Okay, The lizard brain. It goes into effect when something happens that's a spontaneous threat. When we don't know what's going to happen. If I see guys down the street um, throwing firecrackers onto the street and I walk up, I'm not going to be startled. But if I'm walking along the street in the dark and a guy throws a firecracker out and it blows up behind me, I'm going to, that's going to be a perceived threat, okay? Because I don't know what that is, okay? Now, the amygdala, that limbic brain, doesn't see good or bad. It doesn't see threat or safety. It just sees stimulus. And when a stimulus comes up that's spontaneous, where we don't know what's going to happen, loud noise, explosion, car drives by, boom, it's backfire, the amygdala takes over immediately, okay? Now, when it takes over, it's in 100% control, all right? And inside the amygdala is the sympathetic nervous system controls, which turns on all of those survival instincts and all those things that take place, okay? Now, as we assess the situation, Sometimes the amygdala starts to back off and allow a little bit of the cerebral cortex to come back into play. We're going to talk about how that happens. But that middle brain is designed to keep us alive and only that, okay? Here are the things that happen when the amygdala takes over due to a perceived threat or startle response, if you will. You're going to get an activation of the startle reflex. Now what that is, is it's a physical way of protecting the human body. The hands go up because our eyes are the most important sensory organ that we have. Okay? We can't see, we can't fight, can't survive, can't see the lion or the tiger or the bear. The shoulders hunch up because what's the most vulnerable part in the human body? the neck, okay? Two millimeters underneath the skin is, is the... is my life, okay? <laughs> the carotid arteries, they get, they get nicked or cut, it's over. And where do animals attack? Where, where, does, a, where does a mountain lion attack? It attacks the neck, okay? Shoulders come up, hands come up to protect the eyes. The legs flex because that's part of that fight or flight. I can either run or I'm in a defensive posture where I can explode into power, okay? Stomach tightens up to protect the middle organs. Why do they tell you to roll over and curl up in a fetal position if you're being attacked by a bear? Because we have a rib cage back there that is a pretty good protective covering for our internal organs and a backbone. We're more vulnerable from the front than we are from the rear to most degrees. The chemical cocktail also as a part of that amygdala it's turning on the, the, uh, um, the adrenal glands so adrenaline has been dumped into the body okay it's a supercharged fuel it's like jet fuel going to afterburners. Boom! So everything that I can do now, I can do a lot faster and a lot quicker and with more power, okay? Think about when people pick up cars off, off. Remind me later, I'll tell you some stories about that, the power of that adrenaline dump. Neoepinephrine floods into the system. That's to sharpen all our senses so that we're very much more acute in hearing, seeing, all of those good things. Cortisol is dumped into the system, which helps your body regulate blood pressure so that that heart is pumping and, and the blood is taken care of, getting to all those core muscles and the brain, 
okay? So you get all of those effects. Now, what happens is when you have an event like that, you lose the loss, loss of your fine motor skills, okay? A lot of people compare it to being putting on oven mitts, okay? So you have only gross motor skills left. And we're gonna talk about that in a second, but that's a part of that adrenaline dump. So when this stuff happens to you, you have to understand something. You're not scared, because a, a lot of people misinterpret what's going on with these physiological effects and psychological effects. They think, okay, I'm scared. I'm, being, I'm not a man, I'm not, I'm not a brave, I'm not a warrior. No, what's going on is your body is preparing to save itself from harm, okay? But again, when I talk about knowledge destroys fear, when you have things happen to you for the first time, you don't know what the hell they are. Oh, don't know what the heck they are. Um, <laughs> it's not because you're scared. Your body is trying to protect itself, to save itself from harm, okay? So, physical, what happens there? Auditory exclusion. I don't know if any of you have ever been deer hunters or have you ever been in an environment where, uh, I mean, it's one thing to go to the range and shoot a pistol or a rifle and go, holy, holy smokes, that, that's loud, you know? And I, and I suffer, as many others probably do, from uh, tinnitus, from being around too many of those loud explosions my whole life. Um, it does damage to your ears because it is so loud that it hurts. But yet, if you're a deer hunter and a deer comes running by and you have your 30-06 and it's boom, 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 you're not wearing hearing protection or anything, but it doesn't hurt you at all. Police officers have said, look, I've been in a situation where I didn't hear a thing, but I could hear the shell casings hitting, hitting the floor. Ting, ting, ting. Not hearing one single gunshot. Auditory exclusion. The ear literally can almost physically shut down to prevent that sound from entering. And it happens in an in a instant. Tunnel vision, all right? Very common. Because the eyes dilate and we're focused on a threat, because generally anything that happens that, that I perceive as a threat, a startle reflex is, is uh, initiated, I automatically turn to face the threat. If the noise comes from behind me, what's the first thing I do? I turn around. Boom, okay? We want to see what that lion or tiger or bad guy, where they are, who they are, and what they are. Tunnel vision makes us focus on what's directly in front of us because at that point, because again, we are products of our evolutionary past. We were designed to fight off saber-toothed tigers. And so if we're dealing with a saber-toothed tiger in front of us, we're not worried about what's going on over here or over there, okay? We survived better chances, odds of survival if we're focused on the threat. So we always will face the threat. Uh, the eyes dilate to take in more light, all of that good stuff. Um, mentally, there's a lot of things that happen in your mind because at that moment of not knowing what something is, because you have to go through a process, and we're going to talk about that too in a minute, um, you can't really think, okay? Because everything's being turned on by these chemicals and by the limbic brain taking over, and you're not really thinking at that moment, okay? Consciously. All right? Now, the way I define that is there is your brain, which runs everything in your body and keeps you working and alive and conscious and all that. And then there's the mind, okay? The mind is who you are. That's your personality. That's your life experience. That's all the things that you make you uh, Ernest Emerson or Rick Delmon or whoever it happens to be. That's the mind, okay? 
But in a situation where there's a startle reflex or a fight or flight mechanism engaged, the mind is not in control, the brain's in control, all right? So it takes a minute for the mind to be able to assess what's going on and figure out threat or non-threat, okay? But you, gotta, you have to be aware of that. Which brings us to the OODA loop. Now, there was a, a very, very famous uh, uh, colonel, United States Air Force, named John uh, Boyd. And they called him 32nd Boyd because he was able to get the drop on anyone in aerial combat in under 30 seconds. Okay, now, he went back, when he was in the Air Force, went back through time and started looking at all the data of fighter pilots from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, etc. And he found out some interesting things. And one of the most interesting things was when is it, he found out when it's most likely that a, that a fighter pilot will be shot down in aerial combat. When is a fighter pilot most likely to be shot down in aerial combat? On his very first mission. That's when most guys get shot down. But, looking at the data, once those pilots had completed 12, 13 combat sorties, they never got shot down. You made it through the first 12, first dozen combat aerial engagements, 200 engagements, 300 engagements, never get shot down, all right? Why is that? Remember I talked about all those things about the adrenal and the oven mitts and all that good stuff and you can't use fine motor skills and all that? Well, think about a fighter pilot flying out over Mach 1 in a 35 or 40 million dollar machine. Uh, all the controls that he has in front of him. He's in combat, he's on a mission. He's got all of his, the other members of his squadron with him. There's a lot going on. He's got to be in control of his environment. Okay, so what Robert or what John Boyd said was, "Wow, maybe we could put these guys through simulated combat and get those first 12 missions out of the way, so that when they actually take off the aircraft, deck of an aircraft carrier for the first time to engage in combat, they're seasoned veteran." Okay, Top Gun Navy Fighter School is because of John Boyd. And we have the best fighter pilots in the world, bar none. No country, can, no country can take that mantle away from us. We are the best in the world because of our training, because of John Boyd. And he also developed Air Force Red Flag and a whole bunch of other things. The principle here is, in order to prepare for combat, you have to simulate combat in training. So that what you're doing, essentially, are there any doctors here? called stress inoculation, okay? Just like you inoculate someone against a disease, what do, you, what do you put in the shot that you give somebody to inoculate them against a disease? You give them a little tiny bit of the disease, maybe a killed virus or whatever it happens to be, so that the body builds up an antibodies against that. So when the real deal hits, it's ready to fight. Well, it's the same thing with stress, okay? you can stress inoculate by forcing people to practice as close to real as possible, all right? That's why we have things like, it's called simunitions. It's, a, it's, a, um, it's an actual round uh, fired by gunpowder, but it's a marking round like a little plastic pellet, almost like a paintball, but in a real gun, uh, so that police officers and military can practice shooting at each other and getting that feel of actually being hit by bullets and things like that that are not going to hurt them, but the sound, the confusion, the noise, and uh, all of that stuff is a part of their training so that when they run into a bad guy, they don't run into one of those hesitation shootings. Boom, they've seen this before, they know how to do it, and they're just going to go with their training. All right. Now, one of the reasons that John Boyd was so effective at what he did was he 
identified what happens in the, in the brain when a person sees something for the first time. Okay? And he, he called it the OODA loop. And that's an acronym for, number one, observe, which means I see something. Okay? Number two, orient. That means I've got to figure out what it is. Okay? So I see it. Now my brain, the cerebral part of my brain, is trying to figure out what it is. Number three, now I've got to decide what's my response to it. Threat, non-threat. punch coming at me, duck, whatever. Fourth part of UDA is act, which means now I got to decide what to do, okay? Which means I saw the bad guy, I saw his fist coming up, looks like he's going to punch me, I've oriented on it, it's coming in, I've decided that I better duck, and then I act, which is the actual duck, okay? That happens every single time. And it doesn't have to do with threats or, or non-threats. If I walk into the house and the TV's on, I go into an OODA loop. Because now I've got to see what's on TV. Oh, the TV's on. What's on TV? Oh, that's the Seinfeld episode 38. Oh, I've seen it. I'm going to ch change channels. That's an OODA loop progression. Okay? You do it all the time in your car, by the way. Guys changing lanes. The reaction, action, turnaround. Okay. Very important. The longer you are reacting, the longer you are out of control. Okay? Now, remember I said number one, rational fear, la loss of control, lack of control. The number one thing that you have to think about in the, in the reaction, action, turnaround is the longer I'm out of control, the longer I am at the mercy of the bad guy because he is in control and I am reacting. Now, as an example, why does that happen? Okay, well, in some of the training that we do, I take people and I say, look, we're going to do a little drill. Now, I'm going to take an uh, airsoft pistol and I'm going to tuck it right here in my waist so that you can see it. And here's the airsoft pistol. Now I want you to stand over there 15 or 20 feet away. And of course we've got goggles and some protective gear on. And I want you in what is called a low ready position, which is your gun is in your hand, your finger's not on the trigger, but it's pointed like this. You know I'm there so that you've got your gun right here. So all you have to do is raise it about 10 inches to shoot me square in the middle of the chest. Okay, that's, all, that's the only thing that has to happen. The gun has to come up and you've got to pull the trigger. All right? I can take that gun that I have in my waistband and go like this and fire a round off and shoot that other person before they can get from here to here. Now they know I'm going to do it. How is that possible? I'm not Flash Gordon. Well, it's possible because of one principle. You cannot react faster than I can act. Okay? Because of what? The OODA loop. So knowing that, I will always win. Because I'm in a race with somebody, but I'm the one who says start. There's not someone standing there. If, if we were standing there and someone went three, two, one, go, he'd shoot me first every single time. Okay? It's not speed. It's the fact that he can't react. He can't decipher what I'm doing quicker than I've already... I've made the decision to act before he even knows what's going on. So my, the whole mental process on my end is already taking place. The only way to shorten that sequence is to have a plan of action in place before something happens. Okay? The OODA loop can be broken, even though I just told you that's what happens every time you see something for the first time or an unknown thing. But if I have a plan before it happens to do something, I can shorten that up because I go from immediately from observe to action. I eliminate two parts of equation, okay? We're talking milliseconds, but I'm telling you, it's a, it's a long millisecond when somebody's slinging lead at you. 
and I need to have a bias for action. Remember I mentioned that at the beginning of the lecture? I need to know that I'm ready to go. I am willing, ready, and able to take physical action, okay? Slow people, they don't have as high a survival rate in, in natural disasters and everything else, okay? And I don't mean just slow, like uh, someone who's 150 pounds overweight. I mean mentally slow people. You gotta think fast, okay? Now, all of those things that I've been talking about that take place in your body, the, the physiological reactions, the freezing, the submitting, the fight or flight, all that good stuff, we're all subject to it. But when they do the stress inoculation, like on those uh, fighter pilots, what happens is they have the same reactions, but they get through them real quick because they're used to it. They know what's supposed to happen, so they're not taken by it, so that it controls them. They're controlling it. Remember what I said about making uh, uh, the loss of control? Me making decisions in the middle of chaos is me starting to take back control of my environment, okay? Just making decisions is a major, major piece of my survivability factor, okay? What can you do when this stuff happens and we all get sick, all right? Because fear can take your breath away. <gasps> okay? Heart rate goes up. Your heart rate can go from basically from resting heart rate to 220 beats a minute in about half of a second. Okay? So yeah, it can take your breath away. That's like getting shocked by one of those uh, defibrillators. But breathing can take the fear away. Now, how is that possible? Okay, remember I said that about the limbic brain? Well, we have the autonomic nervous system and we have the somatic nervous system. Okay? The autonomic nervous system is everything that you don't have control of. That's breathing, that's digestion, that's the heart pumping, all of those good things, you know. We don't control that. We sleep at night, if we didn't have an autonomic nervous system, we'd die, okay? Because we can't think about keeping ourselves alive. The somatic nervous system basically is me being able to move my hands, uh, can't wiggle my ears, but all of those things that you do consciously is part of the somatic nervous system. Well, guess what? Breathing is part of the autonomic nervous system. And so is blinking, along with all of those other things. I can't control that, except for blinking and breathing. They cross over between autonomic and somatic systems. So, when that limbic brain takes over and I am in its grip and I cannot make a conscious decision, I need to smash a doorway into the middle brain and start to take control of what's going on. And I can do that by using one of those crossover systems. And that crossover system is breathing, okay? It's called combat breathing. Has anyone ever heard that term before? Okay. By me consciously taking control of something that's going on in the middle brain, I start to calm it down. I start to rein that horse in, okay? Combat breathing. Very, very simple. Do it in a count of four. It's not four seconds, it's just a count of four. You breathe in through the nose, a deep breath. One, two, three, four. 
Hold it for four. Blow out through my lips. Count of four. One, two, three, four. Hold. One, two, three, four. Breathe in. Hold. Out through the lips. Hold for another four. You can take a heart rate that's cruising along at 175 to 185 beats a minute, which is when all of these things take place with the oven mitts and all that stuff, by doing three or four sequences of that combat breathing, you can lower your heart rate by 40 or 50 beats per minute. It's a proven, proven fact. Okay? Breathing will take that fear away. And you can talk to, they teach it to every, did you, did they tell you that when you were in the Corps? Did they teach you? Came in later. They teach that to every, every soldier now learns how to do combat breathing. Because that will calm you down in the middle of chaos, okay? And that is a valuable skill, combat breathing. Now, another factor in being able to survive in a dangerous event are the attributes of a survivor. What are those? There are commonalities. You can, you can take earthquake survivors, hurricane survivors, bombing survivors, combat survivors, flooding survivors, doesn't matter. There are common traits that run between all of those people that make it out alive. Air, airplane crashes, all of that stuff, okay? Car crashes, everything. There are certain things. Physical fitness, okay? Speed and quickness. Strength and power. Very valuable survival skill. And I don't mean for fighting somebody off, but if you're, it's, it's like a guy going in for an operation and they say, man, you're in good shape. It helped you recover quicker from the operation. It's the same thing. The, the stronger and more physically fit you are, the better you're able to put up with a lot of abuse to your body. Okay? And a friend of mine has a real good quote. He said, look, strong people are harder to kill and they're generally more useful. And I, and I think he's 100% correct in, in saying that. Plus, when I say quickness, Remember when I said escape? Being fast on your feet, that's a good survival skill. Because another, one of my friends told me one time, he said, Ernie, you know, track and field was invented when two cavemen ran down a deer and the fastest guy got to the deer and killed it. And when the slower guy caught up to him, that's when wrestling was invented. <laughs> Self-confidence, huge, huge, power of the mind again. Self-confidence, belief in physical and mental dominance, okay? You can't beat me. I will not give in. I'm not letting this take away my dignity. I'm not letting this best me. <coughs> belief, belief. Not questioning, belief in physical and mental dominance. That bad guy, when the moment comes, I'm tearing him limb from limb, period. Because I know I can do it. Okay? Vince Lombardi also said something when it came to physical fitness and all that, that I, I think you might relate to. He said, fatigue makes cowards of us all. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been to the point of complete and utter exhaustion, but I'll tell you what, when you are, there's a little voice in there going, come on, give up, stop, okay? And I've been in a couple near drowning situations where uh, no bones about it, I had that voice in my head too going, just give up. You know, you're, you're out. It's over. It's done. And I didn't listen to it, okay? Because I had belief in my physical and mental dominance. A reason to live. Dedication to a belief or cause. Faith. Family. 
a buddy, teammate, okay? They found out in World War II, the Brits did, that they formed units that consisted of men that were from the same city, that they, they fought much harder, and they had a higher success rate and fewer casualties in the field. And they were like, wow, what's, what's up with that? Well, guess why? Because you were fighting for people that you, that you grew up with. You were fighting with people that you went to school with. You're not going to let them down. Because you had a reason to live and survive. Faith in God. Loved ones. I want to see my daughters walk down the aisle. I want to see my son graduate from Annapolis. I want to save my buddy. Most guys in, the, in, a, in a foxhole, they'll tell you, man, they weren't fighting for... They weren't fighting for old glory as much as we'd like to think they are. They were fighting to save their friend who was right next to them. And he was fighting to save him. A reason to live. Okay, knowledge, another survival attribute. Exactly what we're doing tonight. Knowing about the bad guys, knowing about the things that happened to you, knowing about some of the things that you can do to help yourself through that situation. That's all that education and knowledge part of it. Right? The more you know, the better off you are. Preparation, okay? Is being prepared being paranoid? Only if you're being prepared to be attacked by Martians. <laughs> now, why do I say that? Because there's a lot of social stigmas about being one of those guys. Oh God, he's always thinking about the bad things to happen and all that. No, I don't only think about that. It's only 99% of the time. <laughs> but I want to be prepared because it's like carrying a gun, okay? police officer will tell you this. I'll thank God if I went my entire career and never had to pull my gun out of my holster. But I will also thank God if I had to pull my gun out of my holster that I had my gun. It's the same thing. It's being prepared. If you never have to use it, then how outstanding is that? But if the you know what hits the fan and you're prepared, it's just like quick preparedness. Come on, guys. I guarantee you that, I'll guarantee you this right now. I'm willing to bet that over half the people in this room don't have an earthquake kit in their house. It's just a fact. We got, we're busy. We're too many things going on. Oh, come on, it's an earthquake. What's, what's that going to really do? Okay, well, if, if it's a real bad one and infrastructure goes down or overpasses, fall and block freeways and all that, guess what's going to happen when you run down to the store to get some water because there's no more water? Well, you're going to be about the 500th person in line who's already cleaned out all the water. So being prepared really is, it's like buying insurance. I mean, if I buy life insurance, I'm never going to get to benefit from it because if, if it gets cashed in, it means I've checked my chips, right? My wife and family will get it, and that's good for them. But being prepared is like having life insurance that when you need it, you get to cash it in. Okay? It's real simple, and I'm not telling you to be survivalist or anything like that. I'm just saying preparation, okay, and dedication. That means, look... I've decided this is part of my lifestyle, this is part of the things that I'm going to do, so I'm dedicated to it, all right? Ferocious resolve, okay? What is ferocious resolve? Remember I talked about the, uh, uh, the mental part of the attributes at the beginning and the proper mindset, okay? Ferocious resolve is literally the willingness to do anything to survive and to never, ever... <laughs> I just had a startle reflex. Okay.
All right, now, willingness to do anything to survive and never ever give up, okay? Never ever give up. Never ever ever give up, okay? That's ferocious resolve. That's that's what we drum into. Let me ask you a question. Who do you think is the toughest human being that walks the face of this earth? The toughest human being. 120 pound marine just out of boot camp. Sopping wet 120 pound marine just out of boot camp. Okay? Why is that? Because you know what? Because he has ferocious resolve. He knows there's no other person on earth that's going to outgas him, outfight him, outlast him, or dominate him in any single way, shape, or form on this earth. Okay? Because they have drummed it into him. They have remolded that individual into a person who has those extreme confidence levels and the physical fitness and all of the other things we're talking about and the re ferocious resolve. And that's why Marines are able to do the things that they do. They're our number one slam in on the beachhead. The, the, the Marines are still feared all over the world. Now, we were in the middle of a bunch of stuff that's somewhat blunting our capabilities as a military force in the, in the world, but I'll tell you what, there's one, there's one unit on Earth that the bad guys still fear, and that's the United States Marine Corps, okay? And it's because of that right there. Decision making, okay? You gotta start making decisions. An Air Force survival instructor, instructor told me one time, he said, Ernie, the people that survive are people that can make correct decisions real quickly, all right? That's why they have survival training, okay? So that you run into these things. It's the same principle as Top Gun. You, they take the guys that are pilots or people, they put them through survival training schools so that they know how to they gather the knowledge, they know how to find water, they know how to navigate, they know how to evade the enemy. Uh, and they, they pound all of these attributes into their heads, okay? But you've got to understand something. You need to make decisions. Making decisions is also part of that taking back control of the environment. Because you cannot let the environment control you. You must control the environment, okay? So you gotta take these steps towards that. There's no perfect decisions, but the goal is to make the best decisions with the information or the situation that you have at hand. General Patton said one time, look, a good plan executed now, violently, is way better than a perfect plan next week. And he knew what he was talking about. Because he really was going to drive all the way to Moscow. They put the reins on him. Ability to control emotions. Okay, In a bad situation, whether it's a hurricane or a tornado or a terrorist attack, there's going to be people that are hurt, maimed, killed, or injured around you. And they may be, they may be a loved one. They may be a son, a daughter, an aunt, an uncle. We don't get to pick that. Only the, the Lord knows when, when it's time to go. But you need to be able to detach yourself from that so that you can still continue with your primary goal, which is to survive and to help ensure the survival of anyone else that needs that help. So you've got to put that on hold. And again, you've got to think about these things before they happen. Because if you're, if you're, if you turn into a, puddle of jello because your best friend was taken or a parent or something like that, you're probably the next one that's going to go, okay? And if you're in charge and if you're one of those people that's, that has people under your responsibility, you can't let that happen. Knowledge destroys fear. Now what we've done tonight is we've talked about all of these different things so that when it happens to you, you can understand, well, this is normal. This is me getting ready to survive, not me being scared. There's nothing to be scared of. You confront these things by learning about them, by reading about them, by going to things like this. So that when it happens in real life, it's like, okay, I know what he's talking. He mentioned that. I am going to be shaken like a leaf on a fuzzy tree, okay? And the uh, effects of the adrenaline and all that, and the acute uh, effects that it has on your vision, you will lose... Um, 
you'll lose the ability to see things up close, okay? Because your, your, your vision is going to be focused on things that are 10, 12 to 30 or 40 feet away. So everything is, your eyes flatten. They, they literally flatten physically. You will lose the ability to see things like, guess what? The keypad on a cell phone. You won't see it. It'll be blurry. It'll be like, like I splashed uh, water or, or, you know, who knows, uh, toothpaste in your eyes. You won't see it. So you need to practice being able to dial that number, 911, 911, 911, 911, again and again and again. Because again, what, what's going to happen when that limbic brain takes over is it grabs everything and says, it's all mine, I'm only concerned with survival, so I'm going to put all these things in place, including that loss of near vision capability. So what happens is when you have people that describe what happens in combat or in a, in a life-threatening event, a lot of times they say, I, I have no idea what's going on. My training just took over. And that happens because there's no thinking. But it's going to revert back to what you've been doing in those high stress environments again and again and again, like that top gun training I've seen. So you think you can dial 911 with the bad guy's trying to smash down your bedroom door after he came in the house and you retreated to an area where you've now barricaded? You don't want to go to engage. You want to get the guys with guns coming in to save you and your family's life. So you got to reach out, but you got to be able to do it. You can't just say, I'm telling you right now, I'm, I'm going to guarantee these people are going, uh -uh, not me, I can tell 911. I'll close my eyes, 911, 911. What's he talking about? It ain't closing your eyes. It's when there's some real bad guys trying to do you real, real harm for your family, and that's a whole different ballgame. Like I said, you don't know how you're going to react. If you have that kind of attitude, you're going to get caught with your, with your guard down big time. You have to practice these simple things like that. That sounds so simple. It's like, I mean, there's guys, there's guys that have been in an environment where 911, 911, 911. Information. What number would you like? I'm down 911, 911. Information. They're dialing 411 because guess what we dial most of the time? 411. That was my training. That's what I did when I lost control of my cognitive abilities. Knowledge destroys fear. Be aware, be prepared, be biased for action, and don't be a survivor. Be a warrior. Because now we know what a warrior really is. And let me ask this question one more time. Because I didn't get the right answer when I was asking it before. How many first responders are in this room? Every single one of you. You are the first responders. And you always will be the first responders. Every single time. Because when a bad thing happens and you're standing five feet away from it, the other good guys, it's going to take them a while to get there. You need to be that first responder. If you're in a school environment and something's going down, a teacher or a teacher's aide or anybody in that room or whatever, you're going to be the first responder. So you've got to be able to have a plan of action, think about those things, think about the capacity, the capability, all that stuff that I'm talking about. Because you want to go into action. When I say bias for action, you need to start doing things and making decisions right on um. Suggested reading. <laughs> the Gift of Fear, Kevin DeBecker, probably the world's leading expert. He was a threat assessment uh, uh, advisor to three or four presidential uh, presidents. Um, 
uh, On Combat by Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman, On Killing by Lieutenant David Grossman, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning author, etc. I mean, don't be, don't be scared by the title, believe me. The information is so valuable that uh, don't be scared by the title. Defensive Living uh, by a couple of my buddies, Ed Lovett and Dave Spaulding. Uh, Ed Lovett's former CIA. Dave's a copper from, I believe, St. Louis. Uh, defensive Living was uh, part of required reading for all uh, ground level operators for the CIA for a number of years. Uh, under and Alone. Uh, I didn't get a chance to talk about sociopaths. That's something you have a whole other lecture when you talk about personal security. But Under and Alone by a guy named William, William Billy Queen. He was a uh, BATF uh, officer, and he joined the outlaw motorcycle gang. It's called the Mongols, and it's a pretty graphic book. It's for adults, I'd say. Not, not that it's there's no bad stuff, but there's a lot of description of the things these guys do, and it's it's a very very good window into true sociopathic behavior because you know, people say, "Oh, those angels! Oh, you know, come on!" You know, Mongols, you know, that's just guys on motorcycles. No, no, it's not. Drugs, prostitution, gambling, extortion, fire bombings, and all nine yards. A bunch of bad guys. But, real good view of how a sociopath, how bad guys act, and what they're capable of doing. Tara Beslan, probably one of the worst uh, nightmare. Uh, Scenarios that could possibly exist. You guys heard of Beslan, the school massacre in Russia? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think there was 407, it's either 476 or 576 children killed by Chechen uh, uh, terrorists. Okay. Um, my buddy wrote a book on it because he was over there. He interviewed the guys from uh, what they call Alpha and Mimble uh, teams or Russian Spetsnaz, that are kind of their equivalent of uh, uh, our special forces or Navy SEALs. And uh, it's, a, it's a, again, a really <coughs> horrific book, but it gives you an idea of what can I think he just barely broke five feet. It was probably Lucas, what was he, 135 pounds or something like that? Yeah, one of the strongest human beings that ever existed. Hugely inspirational book. It's a little tough to get because it's, it's, it's been out of print for a little while, but if you ever have a chance, it might have. Fearless by Adam Brown, uh, US Navy SEAL, SEAL Team 5, I believe, uh, who went through. Use the word. He went through hell uh, a couple times over and still was able to become a member of SEAL Team 6, which was after he had uh, lost the use of, uh, of his right hand and also lost the use of an eye. Now, remember, you can be a Navy SEAL, it's one of the toughest things on the planet Earth to accomplish, but when you uh, are selected as a candidate for SEAL Team 6, which there's a bunch of different names for it, but I'm not public available. But we'll call it SEAL Team 6. They're the guys who took down the model. You have a year selection process after you've been a Navy SEAL for four or five years. It's called Green Team. And you spend a year going through that. And then once you pass Green Team selection and you become a member of SEAL Team 6, you're still on probation for pretty much the rest of your tenure. Because at that point, if another one of the guys says, I don't think that guy's cut the mustard. They're, they're going to film you. You'll be disengaged. So this guy went through and became a top sniper <coughs> and through green team, became a member of SEAL Team 6. And again, he had one eye and had lost the use of his right hand, so he had to train himself how to shoot both a rifle and a pistol uh, with his non-dominant eye and with his non-dominant hand. <laughs> Inspirational book uh, by far. Uh, last ones um, are the books that I got out. 
to go over a lot of the stuff that you know, we've talked about tonight. Um, surviving inside the kill zone, seven essential uh, skills needed to survive a deadly attack. Chain reaction training, which is the physical part of it, and then the seven strategies of hand-to-hand -hand combat. All of those things are they're all available. Uh, the, all those books are available on Amazon, not just mine, but all the others. And you can get them and start putting those into your library. Uh, they're fascinating readings, and they talk about a lot of the same stuff that I <coughs> talked about tonight. Now, my family has read a lot of those books because I kind of pushed it on <laughs> And But I would say if you're going to grab one book, if you have a teenage daughter, a teenage boy, I would say you get The Gift of Fear by Gavin Becker because it tells you all about that gut feel. And that gut feel is that, that primary survival thing that I think is so important. Ladies and gentlemen, that, that concludes what I was going to say tonight. If you have any questions or anything, uh, please go ahead and ask. Yes. I want to follow up the earlier one regarding if someone was to come into a classroom. What, what do we tell our kids? Can you tell me what you would do if you're in the adult in the room. What do we tell our kids is the proper behavior? Well, the proper behavior is, is just like any other type of disaster. If you make yourself small, you're a harder target to hit. So you duck and cover. Just like you tell me for um, earthquake survival and all that. Follow those instructions. There's no reason ever to confuse anybody with new information or uh, in information that might go and, and say, okay, but they're taught to duck and cover, taught to duck and cover, taught to duck and cover. But if this happens, stand up and run. All of a sudden you've got this moment of confusion going on at a, at a time when you can't have that. So you go with what they're already trained to do. You just say, okay, duck and cover, listen to what the teacher tells you to do. Because, again, unless they're adult enough to start making command decisions about their own safety, they're going to have to follow the lead of an adult. So the best thing to do is say, look, do what the teacher tells you to do. They're trained. Just like being on an airline, you got to do what, a, what the stewardess tells you to do. They're trained and evacuating that plane quickly and keeping people alive. Um, along the same line, you talked about the five um, if we are, we're in a library, he comes in through that door, I'm forced to I go look at him. Realistically, he's like, well, how do you Okay, that's an interesting point. Interesting, interesting, interesting. I know for a fact that there have been people that have survived because they held up a notebook like this. Because guess what the guy, see, He's not a cop, he's not a Marine, he's not a Navy SEAL. He's a bad guy with a gun. So he's not out at the range training, training every day. Those, guys, those kind of guys don't, they're not disciplined enough to do something like that. They may watch all kinds of crazy movies and that's their training or their inspiration or they may go on the internet and listen to some goofball from the or something. But my point is this, when you do something like this, guess what those bad guys do? They try and shoot around it. Yeah. Now, will this stop a bullet? No way. No way. This won't stop a bullet. But for some reason, again, when I talk about these things that are triggered responses in a human being, there's guys that have saved themselves by holding a newspaper up. Because the bad guy's like, boom, and it gives them that momentary second or two for something else to enter into that situation. Yeah, could he drill that newspaper? Yeah. Could you take a round in the leg? Yeah, well, a round in the leg is a lot better than a round here or here, right? So, you do anything. I, I remember when I was a kid, I worked in a grocery store, and uh, I mean, maybe this started a long time ago, I don't know. But I used to keep two cans of Campbell's soup by the checkout stand. Because I thought, if some, if some guy ever comes in here to rob this store, I was a baseball player, so I thought, man, I'm going to throw these, I'm going to fit in so hard. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, he's going to have to react. He's going to look at somebody. That's a pretty dang good thing to do, actually. Because he's going to, he's going to duck. He's got to react to it. 
Do anything that you can to deter him. See what you've done? You know what you did at that moment? You made a conscious decision. In a moment when you were in an uncontrolled environment. Because you had a plan. You thought about this for a little while, didn't you? Okay. I just, had yes. a, I, I just wanted to make a comment because, you know, on the last presentation they were talking about the Columbine school shooting and all this, and all the kids followed the librarian in, to the library, mm -hmm. right? I, and, and that probably would cause their demise. My thing that I would tell the kids, I think, is the UDA, you know, assess. I mean, yeah, follow authority. But after a while, you think that it's starting to, like, the, the authority figure is losing control. You need to start thinking on your own and start looking for escape routes, you know? I think that's... Well, people have survived by playing dead. Okay? you got to understand, when a, when a bad guy is doing something like that, he's on the time clock. Because he knows at some point the guys in blue are going to show up. So he wants to do everything as quickly as he can. And like I said, if he comes to a door and it's locked, he doesn't spend 10 minutes like, oh, I'm going to shoot the lock off or whatever. I know there's people in there. He just goes to the next room that might be open, looking for a place. Boom. Boom. OK, that one's open. I'm going in there. That, that's what's going on. He is, he is subject to all the same things that we described here tonight. All that stress is going on in him, unless, he's, unless he is so uh, mentally impaired or drug-induced uh, psychosis that he isn't acting like like a human being does okay but playing dead i mean getting behind something for gosh sakes hiding covering up you know i mean you're going to do what you have to do something that's my point because really please don't hurt me please don't hurt me he's going to hurt you so anything else above and beyond that is going to it's going to start to tip the survival in your favor. Now, honest, I got to tell you, this is a tough scenario. If I can do something that makes me not a victim and he moves on to somebody else, I got to live with that. But at least I, you know, right. I'm not going to say go shoot that person instead of me. But what I'm saying is, you know. At that moment in time, it's, it's almost every man for himself. In, I'm talking about children, right. okay? But the adult needs to be the adult in the room in that environment. And they've got to, be, they've got to say, not, not on my watch. You know, you, I will be dead before you can hurt these kids. So. Any other questions? I'd just like to say thank you all. I appreciate it.